you for joining us for the third and final panel in the symposium to honor Susan Farr on her retirement. This session, Japan in International Relations, is very important because it also reflects how Susan has always been ahead of the discipline. She is trained as a comparative politics professor, but she has written on international relations and trained many students in international relations. Hence, any symposium to do honor to Susan must cover both comparative politics and international relations. I believe her depth of knowledge in international relations is in part because she was trained by James Morley, a professor of international relations at Columbia University. And she's continued his tradition. And we're very happy today to be able to feature several of her students talking about their latest work, looking at Japan's role in the world. So I will introduce our four speakers, and they have each been asked to speak for 10 minutes. I will first introduce, uh, we have Professor Philip Lipsy of the University of Toronto, who is going to be speaking about Japan as the harbinger state. Philip is joining us as a leading scholar of international relations, who has done research on a whole range of topics about Japan in the world order, with a book on institutional change and international relations, as well as a new book coming out on Japanese energy policies. He, of course, is also attuned to domestic politics, looking at electoral politics of the DPJ. So we're excited to hear his new paper, The Harbinger State. After Philip, we will have Professor Sadia Pekinen from the University of Washington, who is going to talk about Japan's role in space, looking at the US-Japan Alliance space policies which builds on much of her research from her first book, Picking Winners, Technology Catch-Up in the Space Race in Japan, to her other work about defense policies of Japan, looking at both market and military and space policy. We're very excited to hear about Sadia's new work. And after Sadia presents her paper, we'll move to Kim Ryman, professor at Georgia State University, who is going to be presenting on Japanese global activism well, actually, global activism, indigenous peoples, and climate change in East Asia. Kim Ryman has been writing quite a bit on civil society, looking at the rise of Japanese NGOs, and is expanding to look at broader regional policies. And we're excited to hear her presentation. After Kim, Mariah Solis, director at the Center for East Asia Policy Studies for the Brookings Institution, is going to be presenting her work on Japan and the New Geoeconomics, which would draw on her earlier papers and books where she has written on dilemmas of a trading nation, Japan and the United States in the Asia Pacific, as well as looking at cross-regional trade agreements and the FTA diffusion in the Pacific Rim. So we have a great panel of experts, all who are former students of Professor Susan Farr. So before we go on to our panelists, let me remind you of the Zoom etiquette that we are going to be asking you, if you can, to share your faces and show video. We will at the same time ask you to keep your microphone muted. Let's go ahead and begin. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my task, as I understand it uh, today, is to uh, talk uh, about uh, big issues in Japanese politics, to think big and to discuss my own research and to reflect on Susan's legacy all uh, strictly in less than 10 minutes. And so uh, I, I think the event very much reflects the high standards that Susan always sets for her current and former students. Um, but you know, I should, I should say that the last one really is the impossible uh, task. Um, so, so let's start with that one, right? Um, the, the question that motivates my uh, contribution to the symposium is uh, kind of a big question that affects all of us. Why study Japan? And I think as a practical matter, uh, many of us have a personal answer uh, to this question, right? It might be a, an uplifting mentor, a formative experience, or an, an interesting class. Um, and, and in my case, I think the role of Susan really can't be overstated. Um, I was always interested in Japan, uh, but uh, you know, throughout my essential academic career, I've been 
told by fairly senior and influential people in the field that I really should stop working on Japan and focus on other things uh, that are more likely to get published in top journals uh, and so forth. And really without uh, Susan's you know, advice and constant uh, communication and, 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 and helpful uh, you know, co comments um, and, and really the community, community of Japan scholars that she's mentored over the years. Uh, I, I, I really think I, I would have given up. Uh, and so um, I really would like to emphasize how important Susan's role has been in my own uh, professional development, uh, as well as the so many others that are here today. Um, so, so I guess we can continue uh, on that thread. So when we think about why we study Japan, one challenge that many of us face um, is that in many areas of scholarship, a personal answer is sufficient. And I can say this with some credibility because I've published on IPE, international organizations, democracy and institutions. Um, and you know, you need to establish substantive importance. You need to write a few sentences about why this is an important issue, but that generally suffices. Um, whereas I think there tends to be greater skepticism about studying Japan in the field. Um, and I think this is due to two kinds of bias. Uh, there's a bias against country expertise that has developed in the field. A very senior colleague once told me, it's not political science if you're studying something that's a proper noun, right? And Japan certainly is uh, a proper noun. And that kind of attitude does very much exist in parts of the field. I think there's also a bias against Japan per se. Um, and this uh, reflects, I think, the perceived decline of Japan's international standing over time. So this is more of a real politic angle that says, you know, Japan might have been worthy of study in the 80s, but uh, maybe less so today. And you can point to figures like this, right, that chart Japan's share of world GDP over time. And, and there's a peak in uh, the 1980s, 1990s at about 18% of world GDP. And since then, uh, the number has come down to about 6%. And this largely reflects good news. It's not just Japan's economy has slowed down, but other economies have been successfully growing. So I wouldn't consider this bad news in general, but in some quarters of the discipline, it's seen as bad news for Japan studies. And I think the, the field has, the, the community of Japan scholars has responded to this in three general ways. One is to say, you know, uh, ignore the critics. Japan is inherently important and interesting, and we should study it regardless of what some people might think is more important in the field. The second uh, is to think about Japan as a case of something and to use it as an opportunity to conduct tests of more general theories. And the third one, which is the focus of my contribution in the symposium, is to think about Japan as a source of theorizing that has wide and general applicability. And so I'll talk about my work here just so that I, it doesn't come across as criticizing other people. Um, so I've basically done work in all three of these camps, right? So this is kind of ignore the critics, right? These are books that I've co-edited that very much have proper nouns in the title, right? Japan under the DPJ, uh, the political economy of Abe government and economics reforms and so forth. And I, I am very much in the camp that thinks that Japan is worthy of study in its own right. Um, I've also done quite a bit of research in, in the second uh, response, which is, okay, let's think about Japan as a place to test more general theories. And much of my work on energy policy and climate change is of this type. Let's uh, develop a theory with general applicability and uh, test it in the case of Japan. And finally, um, and I think a lot of my work ends up in, in this third area, um, let's use Japan as a country that informs theorizing that might then have much broader applicability. And so this is really the story of my uh, first book on renegotiating the world order, which you know really started from thinking about how Japan uh, negotiated its status in international institutions, but then the theory was applied to a much wider range of countries. And I have a more recent piece on COVID-19 and the politics of crisis uh, that's in a similar vein that draws on Japan, but tries to theorize with much greater uh, general applicability. Okay, and so the reason why uh, I'm focusing on the third response here 
is because I think the third response has significant potential. Uh, the, the first response to ignore the critics uh, leads to one kind of potential marginalization, which is it's hard to publish Japan-related work in top journals. Um, and the second one uh, essentially concedes ground and says Japan is basically uh, substitutable with other countries. And so it might lead to marginalization of a different sort that graduate students might say, okay, Japan is hard. If it's basically no different than New Zealand, which also does electoral reform, maybe I'll go study that country instead. But the third uh, response, in my view, um, might have significant potential, not to say that the other two don't. And so that's, that's the reason I uh, focus on that uh, today. And so the, the argument that I make is that Japan can be thought of the harbinger state, a country that experiences many challenges before others in the international system. Uh, no connection to Shinto Sakigaki. I know somebody's going to raise that question. Uh, it's not, it's, it's completely unrelated. Um, uh, studying a harbinger state, I argue, can shed light on the political challenges and contestation that other countries are likely to confront in the future. Right? Japan is a set a step ahead of other countries. And so if we begin developing theories about Japan, then those theories will over time have wide applicability to the rest of the field. Um, and therefore studying Japan uh, can lead to theoretical insights, early assessments of empirical evidence and offer lessons to policymakers about the challenges of the near future. And um, you know, I won't go through this entire list, but you can list up a whole variety of areas where Japan has potentially at least played this role. The economic transformation, I would argue, has been the one that's received the most attention over time. We can think of uh, the developmental state, state intervention in the economy during Japan's high growth period, uh, Masaoki's uh, notion of institutional complementarities that uh, was imported into political science and became the varieties of capitalism, and the deflationary stagnation, many studies uh, that informed both the policy response and scholarship about the 2008 crisis and Euro crisis that came afterwards. But I would also say demographic and societal transformation because of Japan's rapid aging that's ahead of every other country in the world and a variety of associated social phenomenon that are initially reported as unique to Japan, but turn out to be very much prevalent in other societies with a slight lag. Um, and as I said, in my own work, the international relations transformation, Japan's rise as a major power in a transformed international order. I think it tells us a lot about how the international order has changed. And so studying Japan, I would argue is quite critical uh, and might inform the trajectories of how other countries rise as well. Um, responding to the rise of Asia and China, of course, uh, Japan's at the forefront of these. Um, and the mini case, I think, is COVID-19. Uh, as, as we know, um, Japan's response to the Diamond Princess outbreak uh, came very early in the pandemic and informed Japan's response, the development of the three Cs based on an understanding of aerosol transmission that came much later in other countries and so forth. So that's a smaller uh, kind of time frame, but uh, has some features of Japan being a step ahead as well. So just briefly some um, data, right? Uh, if you look at Japan's uh, growth rate relative to other high income countries, you had an early period of rapid growth and stagnation. And then what we might think of as Japanification, stagnation, secular stagnation setting in and becoming a theme across many high income countries um, and a slight increase in Japan's economic growth rate as well. But many of the lessons that uh, Japan learned becoming quite relevant uh, later on in other countries. Uh, aging, again, uh, we know Japan as the oldest population in the world, right? The share of 65 plus in Japan is the highest in the entire world, uh, but other countries are very much catching up uh, and the current level of aging in Japan will be matched by other countries. Uh, with varying uh, differences in timing. And we can look at something like public opinion polling towards China, right? Here's another one where Japan came out with very negative views towards China that reflected uh, Chinese uh, encroachment uh, related to territorial disputes, conflict over history issues and so forth, but uh, attitudes in many other countries have really caught up. And so there's been a Japanification of attitudes towards China 
uh, as well. So those could go on and on, but there, those are just some examples. And so one interesting question, which uh, is one that I'm still working on, so I won't talk about this at great length, is why Japan uh, is so often ahead of other countries. And, and I point currently, uh, and I might change my mind on this, to three features. One is a selective openness to change, essentially that um, uh, economic change is embraced in Japan much more rapidly than institutional change. And so this, you can point to a regulatory policy that led to the bubble as one example of institutional rigidity uh, in the face of economic change, but some of the con contributions uh, you know, that Susan has worked on, 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 on the gender dynamics and the institutionalization that leads to decisions not to have children, um, the absence of social support, government support, uh, and so forth. Um, geographic location, the fact that Japan is located in one of the most dynamic regions of the world economically and a source of geopolitical contestation, uh, and constitutional normative constraints uh, that make Japan behave in certain ways uh, that other countries may catch up to later on. And I would argue that these factors are also informative about the areas where Japan is not ahead of other countries, things like gender equity, supranationalism, nuclear weapons, and so forth. And so I'll conclude uh, by saying that we should very much continue to study Japan as an interesting country in its own right. Um, but Japan studies, in my view, should also be central in the field of political science. We shouldn't be at the periphery. And one way to be at the center, I think, is to think of Japan's status as a harbinger state and develop theories about political issues that are likely to become generalized in the near future and inform scholarship uh, that has wide applicability, conduct early empirical tests in Japan, and ultimately inform policymakers about the challenges that they're likely to face in the near future. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Philip. I hope that many young students are listening as well as we continue to pass on wisdom to build Japan studies. Now we have uh, Sadia Pekinen, please go ahead. Let me just unmute myself. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fantastic. Thank you to uh, Christina and Shin for the invitation, and thank you also to the US Japan program and its staff for staging this symposium. It is really a great honor and pleasure uh, to join this symposium and to offer some reflections on this historic occasion, the occasion of Susan's commencement to a new chapter in her life. One of Susan's many contributions to the field was her leadership of the US-Japan relations program at Harvard. Therefore, I thought it appropriate that I would shape my remarks today to speak to US-Japan relations, albeit through the lens of an area of my special research interest, space policy and governance. Uh, so studying Japan, of course, means that I should start with an apology. Uh, so with apologies to the organizers of this symposium who must have thought that they covered every topic about Japan in the world I'm actually going to be talking about Japan out of this world. So <laughs> I just hope that that will be okay. And I think some of what I have to say will have implications for the way that we think about Japan going forward. Not by coincidence, uh, I first began to research space policy when I was Susan's graduate student, including my dissertation on strategic industrial sectors for which Susan uh, was the chair. Today, I think Japan has come a very long way from that early era of space policy. And I want to reflect on what Japan's capabilities, its trajectories and perspectives mean for the US-Japan alliance related to space in particular. It is especially important to do so at a time, I think, when the United States has marked geopolitics with a return to great power competition and also marked space as a warfighting domain. The United States is intent on creating a US-centric space order, and this has not changed under the Biden administration. To bring it about in the geopolitical flux today, the United States needs allies and partners. One critical and perhaps the most pivotal ally in this quest is Japan, a country with which the United States has had one of the most enduring treaty alliances in the post-war period. And I want to reflect more specifically from the perspective on Japan on where the US-Japan alliance is headed. I want to make two very big points. First, at present, it is true that there are concrete ways in which Japan is aligning with US-led space endeavors. Second, however, going forward, I would say we need to exercise caution about taking the foundations of those alignments for granted. 
While Japan is a critical ally, it has long been watchful of its own national interests. And while Japan has aligned itself with the US in the unfolding space saga today, it is no junior partner, but one of the world's most competent civilian and military space powers around. And I think deeper reflections on the basis for Japan's actions and reactions, along with those of other US allies, including in Europe, serve as cautionary notes at this stage. With that, let me begin first uh, with what I see as the main building blocks for collaboration for the US and Japan. And I'll just enumerate these. There are five elements that I think really do bode well for reinforcing the US-Japan alliance in the space domain. To begin with, there is first the contemporary geopolitical situation, which brings the two allies together in identifying threats in outer space and also rivals in world politics. Japan sees threats in and through space the same way as the United States, and Japan emphasizes the importance of stable, secure, and sustainable access to space and of reducing risk to space infrastructure, some of which emerge from deliberate actions of countries like, but not only, China. For the purpose of alliance politics, what this means is that more and more we're seeing that on the one side, there is the United States with allies like Japan and the newfound Quad Friends attempting to coordinate like-mindedness in cross-domain operations involving space. On the other is China, with a newly minted lunar pact with Russia, which is also anchoring its space information corridor in the customer base within its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. And driven by the top levels of Japan's political leadership in the service of these goals, Japan has aligned its official space policies and postures with the United States. A second building block that I think enables further collaboration in the context of the US-Japan alliance is really the transformative legal and policy shifts in Japan related to the space domain. To make a long story short, Japan has steadily synchronized its civil, commercial, and military uses of outer space, enabling further space security collaboration with its ally. In 2008, it unambiguously began to engage in the military uses of outer space. And in 2012, JAXA's law was also amended to allow it to cooperate with the Ministry of Defense on advancing space defense capabilities. Since March 2013, a Japan-US comprehensive dialogue on space has also been taking place to advance whole of government approaches of strategic interest to both sides, and there are specific MOUs, agreements, and ideas in play. Third, in a dual strategic industry like space, technology platforms are a concrete avenue for collaboration, spanning civilian and also military uses. Japan already has a long-standing cooperation with the United States on ballistic missile defense with its potential for offensive anti-satellite operations as well. It also has other technologies that it seeks to collaborate on in the space domain. And the Ministry of Defense has bluntly stated its interest in acquiring capabilities that not only lead to mission assurance, but that can disrupt opponent command, control, communications, and information. The two allies have coalesced especially on the idea of technology platforms for space situational awareness. And answering long-standing calls for hosted payloads on allied satellites, Japan will be launching US sensors on its own satellites. Fourth, I would say another reinforcing sign for the US-Japan alliance is that Japan has stood up its own space operations squadron in 2020. This is its own dedicated space force as part of the Air Self-Defense Force. Both the United States Space Force and the SOS will over time develop the allies' technical and human expertise to operate and their organizational coordination will further help their doctrines, strategies, and operations. Japan will be a part of a new multinational space collaboration office at Vandenberg Air Force Base with the goals of aligning policies and tactics, techniques, and procedures. A Japanese liaison officer will also be part of the US Space Command, contributing to operational discussions. Beyond the alliance, I should also add that the alignment of the USSF and the SOS may affect the possibility of SSA space situational collaboration with other Quad members, such as Australia and India. Finally, fifth, 
Uh, Japan has also aligned itself with US-led civilian and commercial lunar projects. Since the late 1980s, Japan has worked assiduously on all kinds of civil space cooperation with NASA in particular. Most notably, Japan is a founding member of the international, the NASA-led International Space Station Agreement in 1998, which still remains the biggest international cooperative space project to date. Over time, the result is that Japan has made inroads into the new civilian commercial landscape in the US, one in which NASA has trumpeted the importance of launching American rockets from American soil. It is not a surprise that back to back, it was Japanese astronauts that were part of the first two historic commercial and successful human crew missions by private company SpaceX to the ISS. American private rockets, American soil, but also including Japanese astronauts on the home US team. JAXA Space Agency, uh, the budget has increased in support of these and other future ventures with NASA. Uh, Japan has also signed up as a founding member of the US-led Artemis Accords in 2020, designed to enhance civil exploration of the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids for peaceful purposes through guidelines and best practices. Japan and NASA have also concluded an agreement about Gateway, which is an outpost orbiting the moon to facilitate long-term human presence on the moon. So these are some of the principal building blocks that bode well for the US-Japan alliance. All these things are true, but there is more to the truth. So second, let me return very briefly in concluding to the other big point I wanted to make. That is why we need to exercise caution about taking the foundations of the US-Japan alliance for granted in the years ahead. The most important cautionary note is that the United States is the biggest uncertainty around. Japan, along with other US allies, has cause for concern about the domestic polarization and external reliability of the United States. There is much uncertainty about the policy position of successive US administrations, including the importance of international allies and alliances in the new space race. Japan has concerns about what may come politically after the Biden administration, and it needs to position for that world too, one in which once again, the US calls alliances into question. Another cautionary note I want to sound is that seeing Japan only as a stalwart ally of the United States and a rival of China is problematic, just as it is with European allies. Japan is economically integrated with China and has signed an economic pact with China. It also has an MOU in place with China, which can potentially be leveraged to facilitate space infrastructure investment projects in the name of economic development and poverty reduction across Asia. Japan has also made overtures to China through its own regional space agency forum, where it has the leadership potential to influence the course of such infrastructure projects in the future. And a final cautionary note I want to leave you with is based on the realities of dependence on space assets. The United States is the world's most space dependent power with around 56% of the total operational space assets today. This dependence is America's Achilles heel and both its rivals and its allies know it. Japan is nowhere near as space dependent, uh, roughly about 3% of what is out there. And this may affect its calculus in the, year ahead, in the years ahead about aligning with US threat narratives in space. Over time, this may also build fissures in finding consensus or building common policy positions across international forums. All of this means that leadership and commitment to the US-Japan relationship and the role of people like Susan Farr and the institutions and relationships she has built will be even more important in the years ahead. I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadia. That was a fascinating presentation. Given that we still have more need for international law and technology before, before we can live in outer space, let's try and preserve the climate. And so turning to Kim Ryman, she's going to talk about climate activists. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Christina, and I want to start off by thanking everybody at the US-Japan Relations Program for organizing this amazing event in honor of Susan Farr, um, and of course, 
Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so I, like everybody on all of these panels, have been very indebted to Susan for many years for um, my professional development. She's played an incredibly integral role in that. Um, when I first applied to graduate school, I actually applied to a master's program at Harvard and many other universities. Uh, but I was inspired actually to apply to Harvard initially because I had read um, Losing Face, Susan's book, and was very interested in social issues and ended up in the PhD program and this amazing community of Japan watchers and followers that included not only students and professors, but practitioners, journalists, uh, just an amazing community. Um, that I have always been extremely grateful for and appreciative of. But I think for me personally, one of the key moments in my uh, graduate career, which really has lasted and mattered a lot, was when I was in the field in Tokyo doing uh, dissertation research and decided, I can't do this. There's this other topic I wanna do. And I'm like panicking because I was thinking, you can't change so late in your, you know, your studies because I wanted to study NGOs and activism and nobody was looking at global activism of NGOs and it was not a topic. You know, the books didn't come out on NGOs then, but Susan was like, not only said supportive, but like excited, enthusiastic. And I thought, oh, I could do this. <laughs> and so it really enabled me to kind of tap into my inner activist, jump into my research. And for that, I am forever grateful because it is something that has had a really lasting impact on my life. So that's my little Susan story. Um, and I will now turn to my presentation and I'm kind of going in a different direction than everybody else, of course. Um, and uh, we'll be, oops, sorry. Um, we'll be talking today about some of the work I'm doing right now uh, related to global activism in Southeast Asia on indigenous people and climate change. So Susan, as we know, didn't only do work on Japan. She was also interested in other parts of Asia and international relations in other parts of East Asia. So I'm gonna tap into that part of Susan's history and legacy and all of that. So, um, uh, so this topic is one that is part of a larger global movement of indigenous people that started in the 1970s and 1980s that focused mainly on indigenous people's uh, land rights, their uh, human rights and cultural rights, their rights to recognition. Uh, starting in the 1980s, they started to look at environmental issues as part of their kind of package of issues that matter to them. And in the 90s and the 2000s, it shifted to climate change as being one of the major issues that they were concerned about. So this was definitely um, uh, an issue that was, uh, became more and more clear for several reasons. So according to the World Bank uh, and other studies, up to 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is on land that is either managed, owned, occupied or laid claim to by indigenous peoples, which means that indigenous peoples are the ones maintaining biodiversity in the world today. And they are under threat for many reasons, but they are the ones that are doing a lot of the work in keeping uh, our environment intact. And so on the one hand, you have them as protectors of biodiversity and forests, but on the other, they are also currently one of the most vulnerable pop, uh, populations in terms of the effects of climate change. So weather effects like floods, uh, droughts, all of this because they are a very poor and very land reliant population and live in isolated places have been improportionately impacted as well in terms of infectious diseases, uh, low crops, all these various issues that have affected some uh, people. So turning to Southeast Asia and Asia in general, this has been really, really true in Asia. So um, studies by the inter governmental panel on climate change have found that Asia has a very, very high level of climate change insecurity. Uh, in the 2000s and 2010s, the vast majority of worldwide victims of climate change related disasters were in Asia. And this was mainly or mostly in South Asia and Southeast Asia, these two areas. Um, so on that map, any of the dark spots are the most uh, affected spots. 
Um, in terms of indigenous peoples in Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, according to the Asian uh, Peoples Indigenous Peoples Pact, about 260 million or two thirds of the entire global population of indigenous people live in Asia. And um, not quite half, but a substantial portion of that population lives in Southeast Asia. And this is a really widespread set of people, okay? We're looking at eight countries spread far apart in some areas. Uh, they're speaking many different languages and they practice many different cultures. They often live under very repressive political regimes that have been denying their rights uh, and not recognizing them for ever, actually. Um, so there are a lot of barriers to organizing among indigenous people in Southeast Asia. So given this very challenging um, geographical and political setting, I am interested and have been interested in whether and how indigenous people in the region have participated and mobilized activism related to climate change, because this is something that impacts their life every day and every year. So, um, as I started to do this research, it became very clear that there are several organizations that are regional uh, and global organizations based in Southeast Asia that are the main activist organizations uh, on this issue. And the main two are the Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact and Teb Teba. I will be talking about AIPP since um, it is very active, but also since its membership structure makes it one of the most representative of indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia and in the region. So AIPP was set up in 1988. Its membership now includes 21 different indigenous people organizations from Southeast Asia, in addition to another 20 plus more from other parts of Asia. It is a highly professionalized organization that has taken advantage of international political opportunities to organize regional activism around climate change. So social movement theory uh, looks at this concept of political opportunity structure and global activists look at the global level of political opportunity structures. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about global resources, global organizations, global opportunities for meetings to then go back to home and, and influence your, your, your politicians there. Uh, and AIPP has been very, very good at doing this. It has uh, allied with global partners like international NGOs that have money and that have political clout. It has done very good fundraising among global donors that are interested in this issue. Uh, and it has attended meetings and it has created allies with officials in international organizations at the UN that have also helped build up its ability to organize regionally and, and kind of create a, a, a set of networks within the region. So, um, uh, so what I'm going to do quickly, because I know I'm going to be short on time, is just highlight some of the ways in which it does this, uh, so that you get an idea of how they connect the global with the regional, national, and local. So to start with, um, AIPP and many of its member groups are very active at the global level. They show up at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change COP conferences. They go to meetings of various climate change investment funds by the World Bank. Uh, they are they are there and they're tapping into what the global situation is uh, so that they know what they have to react to and both in terms of opportunities as well as threats because there are some developments that are negative to ind indigenous people that they have to resist. And then they bring it to the regional and national level by organizing a lot of meetings. So the second point, uh, AIPP, a lot of what it does is organize meetings in the region to bring together all these indigenous people organizations in bank, they have meetings in Bangkok and Chiang Mai and other parts of Southeast Asia to prepare for global meetings, but also to disseminate information of what's going on and strategize to what particular groups want to do in their different countries, given the situations that they're facing uh, in different countries. Um, they also organize events to meet UN officials and UN agencies that work on climate change that come to Southeast Asia. Uh, for example, uh, one program uh, that has been a very big issue is RED and RED Plus, which are UN programs on climate change that basically provide payments or funding or support to developing countries that do forest conservation. 
And these also have, can potentially have big effects on indigenous peoples because they live in the forest, right? So um, uh, AIPP, just to give you an example, organized meetings for uh, red, the UN Red Office uh, regionally so that they would meet uh, all the different indigenous people and understand what their different situations are. But then they also would go to the national level and help specific national organizations and groups uh, kind of get involved nationally in these processes. So in Myanmar, for example, the AIPP worked with its partners there to uh, organize with UN Red Program a meeting where all the different groups uh, within Myanmar would come together, learn about what Red Programs, Red Plus uh, projects the government was planning on doing, whether it affected them or not, and then organize their position. So the next day they would bring in government officials and then uh, advocate their position, but also try to make sure that the government had a more participatory process in terms of how it uh, conducted these projects. So that's an example of bringing that global stuff to the more uh, regional and local uh, and national level. I'm probably running out of time, but I do want to touch on the last two points very briefly. Part of what all of this is in many ways is capacity building uh, of uh, kind of trying to give more strength to these local organizations and national organizations and bringing global norms down to the local and, and, and national and regional level. Uh, and what they do, how AIPP has done this is that they have training sessions, training workshops. They actually are bringing in here, putting together training manuals that they can then give to indigenous leaders, translating it into their language. And then that they, those, those groups can then do training sessions about, you know, what is the UN framework uh, convention on um, climate change say? What is red plus? What is this? What are, how do we get involved in carbon uh, counting, et cetera? Uh, so it is a way, one way where norm diffusion is taking place through activists and filtered through activist lens from the top to down to the bottom. However, it's not just one way top to bottom. My last point is going to be, it's also, these groups have also tried to affect global norms and change global norms as well. And this has been particularly true in the case of indigenous knowledge and uh, trying to promote the idea of indigenous knowledge globally. This has been done all over the world, but certainly Southeast Asian activist groups have been very active on this. And this is because indigenous people in Southeast, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia have been criticized for their, uh, some of their techniques and practices. So Sweden or rotating uh, fields has been harshly criticized and criminalized in parts of Southeast Asia. This is a partial burning of the forest in a very controlled timed way, um, but it's done bio, in a very uh, sustainable way. But they have decriminalized this and actually thrown people in jail for this. Uh, so AIPP, along with its partners, um, have done studies, reports to show and to argue and to prove that in fact, if you compare this type of agriculture to the mainstay agriculture done in the rest of Southeast Asia, this is the most sustainable way. This is the best one for, for carbon se sequestration and all of that. So they're trying to change the narrative globally as well from uh, framing indigenous people as climate criminals to making them the protectors of biodiversity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure I went over my time. Um, I just want to end by saying thank you again to Susan and uh, congratulations. I'm excited that you're going to get some time off now. And I know that you're going to keep yourself really, really busy uh, and you're not going to just fade away. We will be hearing from you uh, as well. Thank you, Kim. It's so exciting to hear about transnational research looking at connections across local groups on international issues that almost make us think states are going to disappear, but not quite. So Mariah is going to bring us back to the state and look at geoeconomics. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. It is truly an honor to be part of this symposium celebrating Susan's remarkable career. Graduate school is a transformative experience, and I was very fortunate that Susan was my sensei. She taught me not only about Japan's politics and its international role, but she instilled in me perseverance. I think a lot of people in this call would agree with, that Susan was a top advisor. She expected a lot, but she also gave a lot. Once you were a student of Susan's, you knew you had a mentor for life, that she would offer her wise advice, not only in the good times, 
but also when you most needed it, when you experienced a setback. So Susan, I hope that today's symposium gives you a glimpse of the extraordinary and enduring contributions you have made. One of them, certainly the legacy you leave in your students who are part of the FAR School of Japanese Studies. So uh, with that, then let me offer some brief remarks um, and um, time is short, so I'll try to um, move quickly. And these are just some reflections on what I see as Japan trying to find uh, its place in the new uh, geoeconomics. And let me start uh, by saying the following, um, Japan has emerged as a champion of economic interdependence and of a rules-based order. And in so doing, it has greatly elevated its stature in world affairs. Japan is able to be more strategic and proactive because of long-term changes within Japan the rise of executive leadership due to administrative and electoral reforms, the weakening of vested interest groups that had had veto power over trade policy, the internationalization of Japanese companies through global uh, supply chains, and the return of political stability. And in fact, the track record of Japan's connectivity push is very impressive. Japan has played a leading role in the emergence of mega trade agreements. It has also been very active codifying rules and standards for the digital economy. And it has orchestrated a robust infrastructure investment push in developing Asia. So much so that only Japan is really a peer competitor of China in this uh, field. But Japan cannot just tap itself in the shoulder and assume that everything is good because it isn't. I would say that the rise of great power rivalry and economic nationalism is creating new challenges. It's uh, putting Japan in a very, very complicated uh, position. And it's also therefore bringing an important recalibration in Japan's economic statement. And that would be mostly uh, the focus of my remarks today. And in trying to understand what is happening here, we, Japan does not have to go far because Asia is exhibit A on the opportunities and challenges ahead. On the one hand, we have emer uh, witnessed the emergence of mega trade agreements that seek to nurture bonds of trade and investment with liberalization commitments and rules. I'm talking about the comprehensive and progressive uh, uh, TPP. I'm talking about the recently concluded regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement. So it's the era, if you will, of these large scale, really substantive and deep uh, trade agreements. But on, on the other hand, uh, the region is also ground zero for the US-China trade war and tech competition. And it's not just the United States and China, many other governments are also stepping up their defensive economic measures. And a zero sum mentality seems to be uh, growing. So this presents a new challenge for Japan on how to balance important tracks of its foreign economic policy that I would argue operate with very different rationales, very different instruments, and therefore uh, um, uh, uh, consequences. So one track I would refer to as economic internationalism, which aims for greater interdependence through international rules, whereby states agree to tie their hands, to abide by those commitments, and to follow due process. And if you're talking about a strong uh, regime, like a trade regime, uh, to commit to third party adjudication of disputes. So there's a lot then in the nurturing of economic interdependence through a rules-based order. And then there is this other emerging track, which I would refer to as economic security. And here the aims are resilience, risk reduction, and where states give themselves wide berth in invoking national security controls to restrict international economic transactions, to escape from international commitments, and to privilege domestic industry. And you begin to see that that actually captures a lot of the present moment. So I would say that the external environment is changing quickly and in concerning ways because international economic relations are increasingly seen through a security lens. And China and the United States are operating more as skeptics of interdependence. 
China undoubtedly emerged as a central hub of supply chains, became the largest trading partner for scores of nations. But I also think it's fair to say that China has practiced selective globalization, keeping some sectors off limits, actively pursuing industrial policy with state intervention in the economy, and choosing to decouple digitally from the West under the principle of internet sovereignty. China now has greater ambitions to lead on frontier technologies and has emphasized self-reliance and is committed, I think, even more committed to this uh, goal after a bruising uh, tariff war with the United States, but especially the one that's just uh, 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 gaining more and more heat, the tech competition, and in particular, the decision of the United States to place Huawei and other Chinese telecom firms on the entity list, revealing really a critical vulnerability for China, and that is access to the most advanced semiconductors. Now, the United States, I would argue, is playing defense on globalization. And the more skeptical view of globalization goes beyond frustration with the policy of engagement vis-a-vis -vis China, and is informed both by disappointment on how the gains from trade have been distributed among different groups of society and by a broader expansion of national security concerns in the formulation of foreign economic policy. I think there's a vast difference in the diplomacy uh, uh, in the foreign policy of the Trump administration and the Biden administration, but there are also very important and consequential continuities. And one such continuity is that both the Trump administration and the Biden administration embraced the principle that economic security is national security. And therefore the United States has tightened its national security screening of foreign direct investment, is currently revising its export control regime to include emerging and foundational technologies, Industrial policy is now very popular in Congress and some very significant bills with a significant amounts of money are being discussed as we speak. And the United States, as I mentioned before, has been uh, uh, open and explicit and proactive in exploiting choke, choke points in the semiconductor supply chain. So then what does this all mean for uh, Japan? A champion of economic connectivity in a world that appears increasingly uh, becoming more uh, fragmented and uh, subject to uh, these trends. Well, I would say that when it comes to economic security, there is in fact memory muscle in Japan. Japan has long been sensitive to the vulnerabilities of economic interdependence. Reeling from the two oil shocks, food embargoes, the Nixon shocks, the 1970s, Japan actually developed the concept of comprehensive security, which had a focus on economic vulnerabilities. And this was formulated in 1980. But of course, it's now the 2020s. So even there is that uh, uh, sensitivity to the perils of economic interdependence and the external environment is bringing back that sense of risk. I think that is important that uh, to understand that Japan is pursuing this now adapted and adjusted to the current realities. Because the nature of the challenge is different. We're talking about much denser links of economic integration through supply chains. Because Japan's own international role is different, Japan is tackling these issues now from a position of having consolidated itself as a champion of trade and as a rule maker. And because the capacities are also very different because Japan has developed internal capabilities for a strategic formulation of foreign economic policy. Nor is the essential geopolitical gambit similar, I would argue, because Japan's largest security challenge is also its main trading partner, that is China. And uh, we begin to see then a recalibration in Japan the Abe administration established an economic uh, security division in uh, the National Security Secretariat in the spring of 2020, roughly a year ago. And the new national security strategy with an economic security component is reportedly uh, on the works. 
some of these conversations in Japan, I think, have to do with worries, with concerns about over-reliance on China, concerns about the leakage of critical technology to China and a desire to protect critical infrastructure, an attempt a wish to recalibrate some supply chains and uh, some government documents use a very catchy phrase uh, to uh, move from a focus on just in time to a just in case uh, uh, scenario. And there's also, of course, pressure for policy convergence with the United States because Japan also is interested in remaining well aligned when it comes to these economic security measures. So I don't have time to explain here some of the new policies that are informed by this economic security drive, but I'll just highlight them, some of them, for a, a hopefully greater conversation during the conversation in this panel. One is, of course, the 2019 reform of the Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Act, whereby Japan strengthened the National Security Review of Foreign Direct Investment. It has made it much tighter, uh, will be a number, a much larger a number of companies and sectors that come under that kind of uh, review. And of course, it has created concerns that these may run counter the long-standing role to try to attract more foreign direct investment to Japan. But there have also been some very important and significant initiatives on strengthening uh, the supply chain. And, um, and the Abe government launched this program both to uh, onshore some production, to diversify some production into Southeast Asia. And the Suez government has signed on to this initiative. To this date, more than 200 companies have received something like $3.1 billion in subsidies to recalibrate, to adjust its supply chains. But it's important to put these numbers in perspective uh, because these subsidies are not about uh, producing decoupling from China. I don't think there is any appetite, as Aria mentioned, there's deep integration there. There's no desire to divorce economically from China. Um, it's also important to note that relocation is an expensive proposition. And if you look at the surveys of Japanese multinationals, that's not their first uh, 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 decision to relocate when they're trying to address the challenges, say, of COVID-19. Uh, and there is no requirement for these companies who receive the subsidies to abandon China. It's about hedging. It's about restructuring uh, their uh, operations to make them more uh, resilient. So let me then uh, uh, just add a couple of final observations. And I would say that as Japan builds its economic security strategy, it confronts a delicate balancing act. It must create a more resilient technological ecosystem and supply chain work uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, increase resilience in its supply chain and must also coordinate with its allies to make sure that it's well aligned uh, when all these measures are now being uh, implemented. But it must be mindful not to overcorrect, compromising openness and innovation, robust international exchange, restricting trade and investment flows, and the health of its supply chains, which are central to its economic prosperity. And if there's one message that I would like to convey in my remarks today, is that there is a huge trade-off here confronting Japan. Because Japan, as I said, has envisioned its international role as the champion of the rules-based economic order and has had many successes in that area. But if we transition to a system, an international system, where economic security runs amok, that, I would argue, would undermine the most cherished goal for Japan, the preservation of the open rules-based world order. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariah. It will be important to see if Japan can support that rules-based order, given the strong interest they have in doing so. We now turn to Susan Farr, who's going to lead off with questions. Well, thank you all. Um, Maria, I, I guess uh, I'd like to ask you a question that is really peripheral to your presentation, but I think is of always a backdrop, which is I was struck in the years that I lived in Washington and that there's a constant calibration of how states stack up. And with Japan, Japan has faced over this last 14 months two sort of fundamental 
the challenges of problems they had to deal with, which have been quite public. And one has been the handling of COVID and the other is the handling of the Olympics. Could you say how in the calibration in Washington, how Japan is coming out of these two issues? Of course, the vaccine issue is not yet resolved, but where things stand, I guess I was struck early on before the, oh, the vaccine issue kicked in and that Japan actually wasn't getting much credit for a really remarkably low number of deaths and cases compared to so many other comparable countries. Question for Sadia. I've always felt your work on space is fascinating. And the question that always I wonder about is why in the beginning did Japan put such energy behind moving into the area of space? Uh, and you're saying that now there is a, a war fighting dimension to the space race. But in the beginning, that was not the case. And one hypothesis could be that nevertheless, that long uh, people with a long vision would think that this is actually a way to develop military potential uh, under, in effect, sorry, the cover of space uh, exploration. And that, so one practical question is how the early expenditures on space were budgeted. Did they fall within defense spending? And how has that worked out now? And I say this because obviously the issue of limiting military spending was a hot issue for dealing with the public uh, and keeping this at one point, the ceiling on GDP. So how did it figure into that? And with Kim, <clears throat> I, um, I wonder if you could put Japan into your picture. So here are indigenous groups and civil society groups, and they look to donors for help, for the support for their causes. Japan historically has had a so-called request-based system, meaning that basically the state has to sort of endorse what the giving is for. But indigenous peoples are often, as you say, they can be echo, viewed by the state as echo criminals. So how has Japan positioned itself for dealing with the issues of indigenous people? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. And with Philip, Philip, your presentation was uh, really so fascinating and it reflects the struggles we all work on as we think about how to position our work in relation to the discipline in political science. Uh, in, in your examples, uh, it seems to me you, you didn't give too much attention to so, some paramount examples, one of which was the flying geese, the whole East Asia model that Chalmers jo Johnson rode as his initial kind of uh, way of making a splash. Japan is a leader relative to other countries in East Asia. And my question there is, is that just dead or is there any relevance? Or is there any uh, momentum that one could, could one get back on that track and make a case of some kind? And the other thing is thinking back about earlier presentations today, uh, particularly Ji Yoon Song's pro, uh, 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 listing of the many different policies to deal with low fertility in Japan. Japan actually is a laboratory so far, not terribly successfully, but trying a variety of ways that could potentially bring women back into the workforce and could address low, the low fertility issue. And I'm thinking about you know more flexible office hours, or work hours, um, child care facilities, even long-term care frees women from care of the elderly. So is that and from your stand, standpoint, a potential area for Japan as a harbinger? Well, great questions. Why don't you each respond to Susan's question and then we may have time to open that to the audience for a couple of additional questions. Thank you very much. So let me just uh, jump in. And um, uh, Susan, your question is very timely, right? Because the State Department has just issued this warning against uh, travel to Japan because of COVID. And this comes at a very difficult moment for the Suga administration. Two months uh, before the Olympics, this just adds to the concern as to whether 
this can be done safely and where the Olympics would not become a super spreader event. Um, I would say that the views in Washington um, <laughs> tend to change, <laughs> um, not like the weather, but they do change. And I do notice uh, several uh, shifts over time. I think that when COVID uh, began, actually Japan was in everybody's mind. We'll remember that cruise ship, the Diamond uh, Princess <laughs> cruise uh, ship, and everybody was looking at Japan and it was not looking like uh, the most um, uh, um, right on a response to this. Obviously, this is was very new and uh, very challenging, but I think that uh, later on we moved to a, a place where the United States was uh, clearly doing very poorly when it was the what I would call the mitigation phase of the pandemic before the vaccines. We were not uh, really making much progress. Masks became a highly politically poly uh, uh, polarizing issue here. And Japan's numbers um, you know, were, were much better than ours. And now that we have the United States has finally uh, had a very robust vaccination campaign, I think that Japan looks less compelling because the campaign on vaccinations has also moved uh, extremely uh, slowly in the case um, of Japan. Uh, but uh, to me, really, uh, what this also translates, and I've noticed uh, around Washington, even though it's still the virtual world, there is a more fundamental concern that has to do with the uh, stability, political stability in Japan and what this will mean for the longevity of the Suga administration. And I think we're all aware that this summer is going to be critical in so many fronts. Uh, the opinion poll numbers are coming for Suga and they are very concerning. And for the United States uh, uh, in their Asia policy, they see in Japan a pillar. Uh, Jap Prime Minister Suga was the first foreign leader to come in person to the White House. It was a very, it's a very robust uh, uh, agenda, that and the Quad. And I think that the concern is, will there be political stability in Japan to see this through? Because the United States does depend on cooperation from uh, Japan to achieve many of its objectives in the region. Susan, thank you for your uh, questions. I think you have been asking me these questions ever since I wrote the dissertation and I have been thinking about this question ever since. Um, why did Japan put so much energy uh, into uh, space? Uh, so I wish I could give you a neat uh, answer, but let me try and give you some answers about why I think it has done so. One is that I think um, there's a perception that the space industry sort of started off in Japan um, in, in 1955 as they're attempting to test uh, rockets. In fact, Japan's space um, uh, testing and its rocket testing starts in the interwar period uh, with the army and Navy actually testing um, the, uh, the potential, the military potential of these capabilities. They were shut down uh, by the Americans. So I think it's important to remember that there's no space power that is not fully conscious of the fact that you're dealing with the dual use technology. So for the challenge for Japan has been, how do you present this technology that crosses from civilian to military uses to a public that was very skeptical of uh, military uh, activities in the post-war period? And up until 2008, uh, Japan went above and beyond uh, international standards for thinking about peaceful uses of outer space. It's only in 2008 that the official basic space law allows uh, Japan to begin to engage in the military uses of uh, space. And uh, you asked also a question about uh, budgets. Uh, you know, I think budgets might be a red herring where, when you're looking at the tremendous capabilities that Japan has on both the civilian and military side with the same basic technologies. The average budget for Japan has been about, you know, $3.5 billion per year. Uh, well within sort of limits. only recently that that budget has gone to over $4 billion, uh, just, just this year, uh, in fact. So I think that this is not so much a question of um, uh, technology, but really the intent behind the technologies. So the player to watch in what is happening is the Ministry of Defense and the, uh, the ways that it is thinking about space in terms of a war fighting domain. One of the things I wanted to take the want, wanted the audience to take away is that uh, the U.S. is certainly very clear about space as a war fighting domain, and the question we need to ask is how far Japan can go down the road for some of the same reasons that Mireya is also pointing out. There are economic; it does have to do some calibration 
and there are uncertainties about the United States uh, as well. So those are some of the things that I think we need to keep in mind about why Japan continues uh, on with the indigenization of these capabilities. It's not going to step back from them. Um, so I hope that that gives you some sense of uh, what I think is still a very important question for us to be able to address. Okay, I'll try to be fast because I know we're running low on time. Thank you for your question, Susan. I know I should have actually done a little homework and inserted Japan in there somehow. <laughs> anyway, um, so in terms of being a donor to indigenous groups, um, I don't think you're gonna see a lot of that with Japan. Um, most of the, the official donors to these groups have been from Scandinavia and Switzerland and the Nordic countries who have been very like, donated a lot towards indigenous people's rights in general and, and the thing in general. However, there are some um, Japanese NGOs like Mikang Watch that have been very active and in, in, in collaborating with certain cases and certain issues. Um, you know, for example, the case of dams in the Mekong uh, that might wipe out indigenous people or might change the, the biodiversity in the rivers there. Uh, so we have seen uh, some interest by Japanese groups partnering uh, with groups that aren't always indigenous groups that work with indigenous communities there. Uh, and certainly I think that, um, you know, official development is careful in Japan compared to say China or some other countries in terms of what um, groups and how it might look for them if there is something that isn't happening negatively to some of these indigenous people. So they may not be at the forefront of supporting it, but they're certainly a lot more careful because they, they have an environmental foreign aid component and they want to, 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 advert, to be a green donor, to be a green whatever. That's a component of that that's definitely there. So they, they tread carefully, they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> they get criticized, and then they're they're a little bit more careful, but they're not at the forefront of um, advocating always for this. Um, I'm going to stop. I mean, there's a lot one could say about Ainu and how things have changed there, but that's a whole other conversation. So I'm going to stop right now and give the floor to um, Philip. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll also try to be concise since I, I know we're pressed for time. Um, uh, excellent questions as always, Susan. Um, I, I, I do think um, the literature uh, about Japan's rapid growth and in state intervention um, is, is um, essentially the quintessential case of this. The, the flying geese model, I think, has fallen apart, right? Uh, I, I think the pattern of development in East Asia is no longer even remotely described um, in it, as following a uh, flying geese pattern. But where I do see the continuing relevance of that literature is in the debate over climate change response. Um, and I just sent off a paper recently, um, co-authored with several colleagues about the politics of climate change. And I think there, there because there is such a large role for state intervention, um, that old literature about uh, state intervention in, uh, for the cause of promoting economic growth uh, comes in with a slightly different focus, but for the purposes of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so I, I do think very much um, uh, that literature can still be quite informative. On, on gender equality, um, I mean, I think this is an area where other countries are significantly ahead of Japan. Um, so I would not describe Japan as being a harbinger, but, um, you know, th there may be cases um, where, you know, the, I think in the COVID case, for example, you, you can think of perhaps there might have been some strength from weakness that basically Japan, the fact that Japan's hands were tied in responding aggressively to COVID with legally enforceable lockdowns might have led to uh, certain kinds of responses that turned out well. And so that might be the kind of thing to look for in, in a case like this. But um, I mean, I don't personally know of good examples of that, uh, but that's not to say that they don't exists. But why, why don't I hand over the floor to uh, other questions? Thanks, Philip. It's fascinating to think also, is Japan the first to encounter? Is it also a bellwether state, the first to show the response that others will follow? And maybe there, as Mariah said, the comprehensive economic policies as an approach of economics as national security is another area where Japan's response to complex foreign policy challenges maybe 
reflects what we're now seeing later. Um, it'll be Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Jenny Lind has a question. Hi, everyone. Um, at first, I just wanted to add my voice to all the well wishes and deep gratitude that we all feel towards Susan and that brought us here today. Thanks also to all the panelists for a really interesting panel. Um, Susan, I was one of your adoptive children uh, from <laughs> MIT. And uh, I just have so much gratitude toward you for taking me on, even though I was a MIT student and um, partic particularly for your creation and, and guidance of the Mansfield Foundation Network, which is a network that has connected me to so many people, including many of the folks on this call. So thank you again so much. Um, I just was following on, of course, I had this thought because of Susan's question um, on the, the question about the flying geese and um, Japan's economic model and is their relevance today. Um, the, the Japanese case was, of course, a, a case of what we call investment led growth, um, which is what we are also seeing, uh, what we also saw in China. Today, there's a, a big debate going on about the future of China's growth model. And Philip, I'm, I'm wondering um, what you think about the relevance for uh, that Japan's experience has for that debate, for understanding China's future. Um, as you have all noted and others have noted today, um, Japan isn't talked about as much as it should be in these conversations. And this is one that's really struck me as quite puzzling. Like, this, this, this case of a, a growth slowdown, and we're talking about a possible growth slowdown in the future, and why aren't we talking about the Japanese case? So I was curious, Philip, if you had comments on that. Should, should I respond? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a really great question. And I think, I mean, I actually, when I'm teaching about uh, Japanese political economy, th this actually comes up. And, uh, you know, one of the things I note is many of the studies about China's economic growth uh, compare China to other post-communist transition economies. And, and, and when you do that comparison, China looks extraordinary, right? completely different uh, on a different path. Maybe Vietnam comes close. Um, but when you compare China to Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and sh time shift it so that they're at relatively similar points in their trajectory, they almost look identical. Um, and so I think there is a debate to be had about where does China fit? Is it essentially a post-communist transition country or is it the latest example of a country that's developing along this uh, trajectory that Japan uh, first uh, kind of marked out? Um, so I, I think that's a very interesting uh, question to uh, consider. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, you've opened up many new questions. And Susan, would you like to say a couple of closing remarks? No, other than just to thank all of you. It's been wonderful to see you all. Yes, thank you as panelists and audience. We're going to take a very brief intermission. Susan is amazing. She has been participating and offering lead questions to every paper by all of her students. But before we turn over to have her give final remarks, we'll have a 10 minute intermission. The same link will remain up so you can just stay on if you would like or you may sign off and rejoin us at 530.